and Qatari tanks on the streets of Bahrain. There is an escalating military situation in, over Libya. There is an escalating diplomatic situation over the, over, among Shia in the Middle East about this the Bahraini crackdown, so a tiny country has a potentially detonating effect. Uh, there are live fire clashes on the streets of Yemen. There are in Syria, three towns today, those of you are not on my <coughs> view or on this perpetual news cycle, is it only today that Syria uh, blew up with three uh, towns uh, experiencing the shooting of protesters. Now my job is to try and explain this, and in the story I've noticed three things happening that I think are new, and I'm going to try to talk about them. The demographics, and the technology, and the behaviour. Okay, in demographics, Rick said, you've got youth without a future. In North Africa, you've got 20% youth unemployment, but in, the country, in countries where two-thirds of the population are below the age of 30. In Europe, and for a layer in the Middle East, the crucial layer that helps start these revolutions, you have a more specific thing. That is the graduate without a future. For both sets of people, the economic crisis that began with Lehman Brothers was not just some downturn, uh, not just a blip, as the um, economic person within the US Embassy in London is sure of it. It's turned the entire curve of their life upside down. And their curve was upwards. Do this, you could have had a life. Now, they could only see their lives getting worse than those of their parents. And just to add, both in North Africa and in peripheral Europe, these economic crises raise, raise crises of political legitimacy, obviously in the dictatorship, but also, remember, Southern Europe is taking the medicine dictated by Germany. When I reported from Athens, some of my viewers were shocked to hear them say, that if you go to the mountains and small towns and reach you meet people who lived under German occupation, but what if you think your position on World War II is and whatever your nationality, you have to understand what it is for them to lose their pensions because Germany says so. Watch what happens. Now, for those who are my age, this idea of a graduate without a future or a graduate workforce that certainly faces a deep doom scenario can be easily misunderstood. My, in my generation students, had a liberal education, we didn't pay for our education, we had a lot of time, we didn't have to work, and we got jobs. Now, students are a key part of the workforce. Their casual labour keeps the coffee bars going, the cocktail bars going. They're part of an education industry, some tens of billions of dollars worth in the world. It's a straight swap, you pay this, you get this commodity called a degree or a higher degree. They're pretty crucial to the financial system. Citigroup alone paid $200 million from its student loan in 2007. They're tested to within an inch of their lives, every month, every year. The jobs they get are like indentured labor. Wow, you get a job for a consultancy firm. I only have to stay with them for three years. Their life was going to be better, and now it looks like it's going to be worse. It's clear that the austerity programs that are being heaped on top of the original recession that followed Lehman, and in this regard, Madison is a hard window for you. We've already got it in Europe, and the rest of the world has this, the austerity. We're finding three sets of people um, who it's affecting. This gradual workforce and the students, the urban poor, and the organized working class. But what's new? Well, 20 years of neoliberalism, have taught these people, all three sets of them, to be individualistic. To have what the sociologist Richard Sennett calls weak ties to each other. <laughs> to anti organizations, weak ties to their organizations, even weak ties to their own work, their own book, company. It created neoliberalism, as Sennett writes, an ideal worker who he describes like this, a self-oriented to the short term focused on potential ability rather than actual skill, willing to abandon past experience, with weak institutional loyalty, low levels of trust, and high levels of anxiety about their own potential uselessness as capitalism changes. They are the opposite of the worker in the Weberian sociological pyramid in the hierarchy diagram. They work in networked organizations, their work is networked, their leisure is networked. 
they've begun to struggle using networks. Of course, each country has its own mix. Uh, the size of the urban poor, the radicalism of the student movement differs in every country. But I think what I've noticed as I've reported on this is that the, in, in many of the countries, the social mix is now a lot more like that which created the Paris Commune with a strong urban poor, a weaker organized labor, and a radicalized intelligentsia than, for example, Flint, Michigan in 1937. Michigan. Either way, it all calls to mind for me the warning of Taine, the, 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 the historian of the French Revolution, as summarized. He said, when it comes to revolutions, don't just worry about the poor, worry about poor lawyers. Because in, in, in the student, the lawyer, the civil servant, the doctor, the classic professor, starving in their garret, in their unattended waiting room, there's a potential Jacobin, says Taine. And now, in every garret, there's a laptop. <laughs> and this is where the technology comes in. Of course you'll be sick already of this debate. Is it social? Was it the Facebook revolution? The Egyptian revolution, you think it's an insult to call this a, fa a Facebook revolution. When, when, they, when they switched off the internet, they simply went for, onto the streets more. But I stand on the side that says these movements are being expressed through and created by a new technological reality. But it's not just or even primarily social media. Of course, Twitter, Facebook, WIFO allow protesters to mobilize quickly, to present to the mainstream media, people like me, undeniable evidence instantly, which allows us all to become witnesses, again, almost instantly, to acts of resistance and repression. Who could forget the placard in Tahrir Square? Mubarak, please go, my arms are tired. <laughs> <laughs> Who can forget on YouTube the bunch of older men in Tahrir Square chanting, Condoleezza, Condoleezza, please give Mubarak a visa. I quite call up this new world to worry about the problem is that we can see the But it's a lot of other things. It's mobile telephony, it's mainstream media leverage, it's the sharing of cultural memes of resistance. The snatches of songs, the snatches of poetry, poetry chanted from the rooftops of Tehran during the crisis when you can't go on the streets. It's the constant photographing on cell phones which says to soldiers and policemen, you will end up at the International Criminal Court uh, if your country has signed the treaty which uh, recognizes. <laughs> <laughs> in the debate that's broken out, Malcolm Gladwell famously says what's wrong with social networking is that it can only achieve small things. It can annoy, embarrass, but it couldn't have achieved what the civil rights movement achieved. But for that, you need hierarchy to come from hierarchy. And I'm not hostile to that, but I think it's more complex. I think if you study in detail what the April 6th movement did, they didn't just do social networking. They had a plan, a strategy borrowed from the Gene Sharp's famous strategy guide for nonviolent revolution. They had a network, if you read the interviews, of cells, quite similar to when guerrilla movements organized. 50 people with one leader, one leader knows the other leaders, but nobody else does. What they learned, though, from the 20th century was to try, in the beginning, to inure themselves to the hierarchical dangers of nationalism, of Stalinism, of Islamism, because they, because they, because they had read more than the generation I came from. They, they, in a way, as Foucault once said to Gilles Deleuze, you know, we took 100 years to understand class. We took to the 19th century to understand class, but it's taken us another 100 years to understand power. If you go to a British student occupation, the books on the floor are Foucault, Deleuze, obviously Hart, Negri, Chomsky. Those books were, those ideas were not formulated in the student occupations of my early 20s. In addition to what they learned practically from the anarchist and eco-warrior tradition was the idea of creating spaces, and the space is a conquest. The, the Tahrir Square organizers had learned this, that many of them had not had experience of the Western students and eco movement. And here, I think they've begun to do what the syndicalists did, from Lawrence, Massachusetts, to Buenos Aires, to Welsh coal mines. They, they, they started to recognize that between reform and revolution, there is another space for the expanded control over your own life, over place, over culture, over personal relationships. The British students became so addicted to occupying that 
even after the law was passed, they carried on occupying. But one said, um, you know, after the, well, that law was taken, great, my house is crap anyway. <laughs> and why do I in an occupation with a student home? But above all, they, they use these methods that drive union organisers and left group organisers mad, the lack of commitment, the constant febrility of what they do. I think another, another product of the new technological reality is that propaganda is beginning to become highly flammable, highly hard to make stick. Yes, you get spin doctors on Twitter. Yes, you get outright disinformation. But the truth acts like white blood cells. And it, it, it is more effective in a social media than in a mainstream media. Mainstream media is good at creating bubbles where people can believe a partial version of the truth. Social media is good at popping the bubble. That's all I claim for it. But I think you have to see it, and when you see it used, it is, a, it is an interesting part of the new reality. Finally, I think the technology is making the protests, and that, as it were, the vibe, which you described, is making the protests for the first time in 20 years seem more modern than the methods of those who oppose them. Whereas the old methods, the pure strike, the pure student devil, the pure intellectual thing, the pure riot by the, the oppressed, always were able to be pigeonholed. Finally, I'm going to talk about just for one minute, behavior. Andre Gortz is probably not the most popular person to bring up in the middle of the American Labour's greatest upsurge for 20 years, but he did write a book called Farewell to the Working Class. I don't agree with the thesis. But what he describes in terms of a revolution is very interesting. He said it's first and foremost the irreversible destruction of the machinery of domination. It implies a form of collective practice capable of bypassing and superseding it, that machinery, through the development of an alternative network of relations. I think this is what is we're seeing from Tehran to Madison, is the development of alternative networks of relations and means of struggle that represent the fact that the swarm, the disorganized mass, organized through networks, can sometimes, and up to a point, defeat the hierarchy. But of course it begs the question, where do you go when the hierarchy fights back? And this is the next phase, which I don't offer any conclusions on because my job is to simply report it. There's a host of caveats. Some places they can switch the internet off. Some places the powerful are so strong because they have mass support. Iran, after the Jan has the besieged militia, the poor. China, the Communist Party is a 60 million strong network. It functions like a network. But I want to finish because the, I think these words do describe what is happening with the words of one of the American student protesters. They've gone into their college and set up a store and the, the authority didn't like it and called the cops. And the cops came to arrest somebody, so the students sat down around the police car. And one young guy, 21 years old, took off his shoes and stood on top of the police car and made a speech and then began a mass meeting that lasted for seven days. <laughs> and later, he described what he felt. The act of sitting around the police car, of getting up on the car and starting to speak, of physically structuring the possibility of a community, he said. All of a sudden, there's a self-justifying factor to it. In a way, once it's been established, there might be other reasons for sitting around the police car than keeping it from moving. <laughs> Namely, participating in the community. I have never experienced that nearly so strong as around the police car. Now those are the words of Mario Savio. <laughs> and the act I'm describing was in Berkeley in 1964. And you may have thought, and my colleagues in my profession may have thought, that such sentiments, such idealism, such ability to create the sudden community out of the empty space of isolated individuals, to achieve change through non-violence and through eloquence, you may have thought that the days of all that were gone. Well, they're back. Yeah.